Today we get to talk about database normalization and the principles of data storage. And I was going to ask how many of you know what LCARS is? LCARS. L-C-A-R-S. It's an acronym. Library Computer Access and Retrieval System. What is LCARS? The computer on Star Trek, voiced by Major Barrett, yeah. What's so the the interesting thing here about um, Google and the way that they think about their search engine is that they're trying to get the Google search engine and the artificial intelligence helping to figure out results like that to be like LCARS, and just like Regis said, uh, it, it's so cool that you can now speak into Google Translate and it will give you back the text and a translation of it. Yes, what is that like? totally the future, but a universal translator is, is where that's going, right? Okay, seriously, like half of you guys have watched Star Trek in here. Raise your hand if you have never seen a single episode of Star Trek. <sighs> okay, even like 10% of this class is way too much. If you're going to be in technology, you need to go and watch the, like, all of, just all of it right now. Just all of it right now, okay. And then you had a question about it and said that it was the future, and universal translation. Go ahead, Will. Skype is doing that, yes, and that is a great example of that. So Skype is doing that real time, right now. Have you all tried that tool? I'm going to make you try a universal translation tool during this class. It's already implemented. For those of you who have Skype accounts, you can go check it out right now. So we'll check that out in a little bit. Let me finish off on, on the concepts of why and how LCARS is basically coming into existence, and it has to do with database normalization. The process of storing information in databases gets, gets complicated because there's a lot of redundancy and duplication in databases. And the reason that I am telling you about database normalization and, and something that seems like kind of an advanced concept is actually it's not. It's a very basic one. And I actually didn't get a job once because I didn't quite understand what database normalization was then. Like unto the time that I got asked to do a URL shortening service over the phone for a technical interview once, now I absolutely can't get rid of the, the thought of database normalization in my mind, and so I'm back and answer those questions for myself. When you think about how the school stores records about you, what do you think might be two different things the school needs to store as a class of information about you and about the school? your name and your academic progress, and think what, what might be something that, that gets cross-indexed someplace, like what, what yes, social security number, but, but not even so much you. What does the school need to know? Ignore you personally. What is the school interested in things like? No, you, you per, no, ignore you personally. Think about what the school wants to know about. Not you, but in general. Academics. Academics. What, what, like what kind of academics? All the people that might be in the computer science program, exactly what classes you've taken, all, the, all of the classes that are available, all of the students that are in them. And think about this. They store your user information someplace. But then every time there's a table created for a new class, like ITC 102 or CS 101 or something along those lines, all of the students that are in this class, your names are being stored again in the number of students who are in this class, right? Someplace there's a, there's a database, a bucket that says there are 20, 30 odd people in this class and that is, the, your names are associated with that. Here's something really interesting about that. When I go and I pull up that information, that information is duplicated. Not stored in one place and accessed from everywhere, but duplicated across those tables. And the reason we talk about database normalization is to try to reduce the number of duplicates of pieces of information in a database because there's a lot of information to be stored out there. I, I don't even, I, I usually keep a good analogy in my head, but let's just go with way totally lots right now. I mean, trillions of somethings at this point. So, what did it, some, somebody did an analogy, it was something like um, print the Library of Congress a zillion times and it reaches to the sun or something like that. You get the idea. Lots of, lots of information being stored. And so to reduce the amount of duplication in that information is a really important task for people. This, by the way, is a fascinating way that people apply mathematics to database and information storage. And if you are interested in going into this field, you'll find it really rewarding. 
So if your name and your address and your student ID number are stored not just in the class registration tables, but maybe over in the, um, what are some of the, oh, maybe extracurricular activities for the school or clubs, your information is going to be stored there too. The entire school has a big database. I don't know how many they've got at this point, but at least one big one that's going to have that information stored in different tables in the same database. So where is a place where you could have one piece of information get you to a lot of other information? Directory. A directory is a very good answer. And that's actually a really good analogy for what normalization of a database is. Rather than just duplicating everything everywhere, you can create a pointer system that lets you get to information more rapidly by saying something like, if Jane Smith's information and address is something that we're going to need to put in the class descriptions for the instructors to view, then we want to, instead of having it be that that information is duplicated across all of the class schedules and all of the class registrations in every class table, instead what we want to do is we want to have a way to store that information almost the opposite way where there is some kind of unique identification factor for Jane Smith. And that is the thing that is used to point to Jane Smith's information. Does that make sense? So, and I'm, I'm I, again, I'm doing a thing where I'm simplifying, and, and some of what I'm saying is actually flat wrong in theory, but I think it helps to explain a little bit better what's, what's happening. Does that make sense? Sometimes I choose to go with an analogy that isn't perfect so that you understand the reason why someone would do something rather than telling you exactly how it works in in real life 700 level computer science, right? So what you're thinking about doing is instead of storing all that information everywhere, creating a, a pointer to that information in one place and then storing that pointer every place that you would typically need that information. That's what database normalization looks like. And the tricky and interesting thing about it is that often it requires a human being to figure out what that duplicated information is going to be constantly. There are a lot of different database normalization tools, but figuring out how to normalize a database so that you can access information rapidly is one of those tasks that computers are kind of bad at and human beings are really good at. If I took a picture right now of, say, I don't know, something like, this is a really good example. If I took a picture right now of this piece of paper right now and I clicked on it and I said, Google, what is this picture of? It probably wouldn't figure out that it's a piece of paper. If I if I unfold, I don't know what this piece of paper is. Somebody scratching stuff on it. If I took a piece, if I took the picture like this, and I backed it up against a perfect surface, and I took the picture, and the lighting was exactly right, Google might have a forty percent shot of figuring out based on the the lines that it was looking at that this is probably a piece of ruled notebook paper. But if I took a picture of a piece of fruit, or these two things which are both microphones, Google wouldn't necessarily be able to tell you that those are the same thing. Even though everybody in here goes, yeah, that's a microphone. I know what the purpose of that thing is. That's an apple. That is an Asian pear and not an apple. Google would never be able to tell you the difference in a picture between an Asian pear and an apple, right? So that is, that's the kind of thing that computers are bad at and humans are good at. And if you're interested in figuring out how to get to information really fast, that's a great career path to go into. There's some stuff we can't get computers to do properly. It's one of the reasons why we press so hard for artificial intelligence, and it's why database normalization is one of the key components of getting to LCARs, of getting to a computer that can operate so rapidly that it can answer your questions in real time using normal speech processing. We're getting closer and closer to that, right? Google Translate being able to listen to you and write down your words, and think about it, and then actually send a vocalization back of the translation of what you just said in another language is damn close to a universal translator, right? And then it's a very short step away from that to having Google sit there and, and program in the heuristics that will tell that natural language processor how to, how to really rapidly seize on the most common words in that sentence, look for them fast, and then go, oh, this is Portuguese, or oh, no, that, that's Swahili. And so there are, the reason you might do normalization in language processing is you would do something like, what's something that occurs, you, don't, you wouldn't want to translate a sentence like, she walked the dog 
uh, by going through all th the thousands of languages and hundreds of thousands of different dialects that exist on planet Earth, one by one and going, does it match, does it match, does it match? Instead, what you want to do is very quickly run each of those words through a table that has perhaps the top 50 most common words in each language and go, do any of these match any of those? That is a way faster search because the first thing that's going to happen is the natural language processor is going to go, the is the most common word in the English language. Okay, we're talking in English. Killer. And now we're, we need to put it into French, so le, right? Right? What's that? Was an emoji? Oh, I am so loving doing emoji conversations right now. I just had this hysteria hysterical emoji conversation with a friend of mine last night. It was just pictures and then emoji and then pictures back again. And I'm like, oh my God, but in an emoji face instead. And it's way funnier that way for some reason. I don't know. But, but that's part of how we're turning technology into something that we try to communicate naturally with, right? And Google Translate, Universal Translation, the Skype Translator, these are all things that are trying to take what we're saying and turn it into something that is more universal. So does it make sense when I give you the example of the computer rapidly running through the top most used words in a language and going, these ones match. And I'm going to verify that with the next most common word in that sentence, she. And after that, I'm going to go, yeah, dog's pretty common. And then it'll, it'll come to some kind of probabilistic conclusion. The computer doesn't ever know 100% when it comes to something like that. But as soon as the computer hears the, it goes, oh, yeah, and she, uh-huh, yeah, all right, now we're at 97%. And you can get there that fast with a quick query instead of going, she walked the dog. Is that in French? Nope. Is that in Swahili? Nope. Get the idea? Is it Russian? Nope. It's a lot faster. And then you have to translate it into each individual dialect with pronunciations, which is just crazy. So, but, but how do you tell what those languages are and, and the words that are going to be the best cue? It's still a human task to do, right? Computers aren't perfect. They're very dumb. You can't you can't make them do anything they don't understand how to do it. So humans still have to tell computers how to process things. Making that leap from checking everything to here's what it makes sense to check is what database normalization is really all about. And it's one of the, like I said, key components in heading towards artificial intelligence and especially universal translation. What questions do you have about this? Um. Yes. What, what, kind of, what kind of problems that are they coming up against in processing? Um, I've got a good friend of mine, really interesting woman, who you should take a look at on the internet, folks. If you haven't seen Meredith Patterson's work, it's very fascinating. She does something called natural language processing, and she's on the bleeding edge of that kind of computer science. Um, I was just chatting with her the other day about this stuff. And one of the interesting problems that she's described to me is um, it's not that we need to be able to translate all of human language into um, something that translates easily back and forth, but that what we need to do is set up an agreed upon list of protocols that communicate basic concepts that every language gets translated into and then out of. Does that make sense? So you're creating a node point where you, you don't translate English into French. You translate English into C++, into assembly language, into binary into assembly language, into, and the binary, and I'm, I'm being, I'm grossly overstating what's happening here, but back into assembly language, back into C++ again, and then back into French, spitting it out the other direction, okay? And that central point right there is what she and other natural language processing folks are working on right now to try to figure out a way to make all computers talk to each other. So if you could make computers speak to each other across programming languages, what's the point of having different programming languages? Right? It's pretty cool. Right? If you can sit there and you can tell the computer, you know, that you want it, it's, it's Jordi LaForge can sit there and stare at the computer and go, refactor and change the percentage of energy that is placed in nacelle one as opposed to nacelle two. And the, the computer sits there and goes, I have a degree of probability that says this is what I just got told to do by the chief engineer. And so I'm going to do that thing after possibly asking for a confirmation if my probability and my tolerance is low enough. I'm at 94%. Now, it's pretty important that I figure out if that's really what they meant or not. You've heard sometimes, I think probably by now, 
uh, automatic telephone systems like refills or bill paying systems that you walk through and sometimes you just can't hit zero enough and it just will dump you out of the system rather than giving you to a person because really I mean what am I paying for if not for some customer service anyway getahuman.com or something like ask Lucy or something like there's a lot of good ones like that yeah and I just talked for 18 minutes to a computer at AT AT&T to get my phone refilled and one interesting thing that happened to me was the computer said I think you just said that you want to add a new credit card is that right and I said yes it is and I went okay that's cool and and that's not what always happens right sometimes you 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 say yes and it goes okay and sometimes you say yeah (laughs) and it says I think you said yes is that right that's that right there is the is I mean I can't tell you how cool that is but that process right there of the computer going I'm pretty sure but I'm gonna verify it and having it be able to figure that out is unbelievably cool in the world of computing right that is that is a breakthrough which unf- the reason why stuff like that happens in places that are boring like c- like customer service interactions and stuff like that is because that is where the greatest impact is made on the greatest number of people Elon Musk isn't figuring out how to add in customer service robots like that but Elon Musk is serving a customer base of like six right and AT&T is serving a customer base of millions of people so small changes like that are giant breakthroughs in terms of the, the way that we interface with technology. Does it make sense to you why I'm excited about something like that? Why a computer would go, yes, or is that really what you meant? This is, it seems so simple, but oh my god, think about what goes behind the computer going, I'm not sure, I'm going to check. This is, it's so cool when you think about it, right? So you can do that. You can work on things like natural language processing and the idea that the computer sits there and figures out probabilistically what you're trying to get to how you store data how you interpret it and especially how you prevent the duplication of effort by storing data in too many places is what data storage normalization and a lot of database theory is about information's cool we just need to make it as stripped down as lean as possible so we can make the best use of it any last questions I'm totally gonna make you guys all try to translate Klingon and Skype application right now